Okay, thank you. Um, can I welcome everyone to this the second meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in Session 5, and can I remind everyone present that they should turn off their mobile phones to avoid any interruptions um, or interference with the sound system. Um, and we also have apologies have been received from Maurice Corey. The first item on our agenda today is consideration of four new petitions, and we will take evidence on two of these petitions, PE1598, protecting wild salmon, salmonids from site, sea lice from Scottish salmon farms. The first new petition on our agenda is by Guy Linley Adams on behalf of Salmon and Trout Conservation Scotland, and he is joined by Andrew Graham Stewart, who is the director of the organisation. Can I ask um, Mr Linley Adams to make a brief opening statement of no more than five minutes before we move on to questions, and welcome to you today. Thank you very much. I'd like to um, firstly thank the committee and your predecessor committee. This is the third petition that the uh, that Salmon and Trout Conservation Scotland has uh, sent your way. Um, previous one, P1547, on coastal netting of salmonids, uh, led ultimately this year to salmon conservation regulations, with which we're delighted. So, um, and previous petition to that, also on aquaculture, was fed into the uh, the run-up to the Aquaculture and Fisheries Act uh, 2013. Again, it was a, a very good process and um, uh, and shows the value of the Petitions Committee and the work it does. So I'd like to thank you for, for all those efforts. Um, I'd like to also thank the clerks for their excellent guidance before today. Um, they told me very strictly not to repeat the petition, not to go through it verbatim, which I won't do. Um, but I'd like to just bring you up to date with some developments since we first lodged the petition in December of last year. Um, as you may know, the sea lice data is published uh, three months in arrears by the Scottish Salmon Producers Organisation. It's aggregated data explaining the levels of sea lice on the fish farms um, in the previous three months. In December of last year, the percentage of Scottish production of salmon, the, the capacity of the farms in the regions affected, that were over the Code of Good Practice threshold for sea lice was 58.8%. Uh, Since then, um, it has risen, uh, and the last lot of data we have for March of this year, the figure hits 66.4%. So essentially two-thirds of the production of Scottish salmon farms is operating above the code of good practice threshold for the average number of female sea lice per fish. Now, these are the egg-producing lice that cause the problem for wild fish by producing many juvenile sea lice. Um, so the inexorable rise in sea lice problems continues, and it doesn't appear that the control methods are working. Um, there is still that problem with this being aggregated data. In any particular region, there can be up to 20 farms, so we don't know which of the farms are performing badly. Yes, there will certainly be some better farms in there that are controlling their sea lice well, but the flip side of that coin is that there will be some very poor farms completely uh, failing to control sea lice, and it's up, we're unable to identify those farms at the moment. This was all aired at the, the RACI Committee in the run-up to the 2013 Act, and it, it was the committee's view, that committee's view, that um, that will be kept under review and maybe farm-specific sea lice data should now, should be published. Um, I'd like to bring also to the attention of the committee that, that only this week the Norwegians, the uh, Norwegian Food Safety Agency, has produced an online real-time sea lice database accessible by the public, farm-specific data, data about treatment, um, where the problems are, and, and it's it's... I have to say, far in advance of the Scottish uh, system, I uh, would commend the committee, uh, commend that to the committee if they if they have time and wish to investigate it. Unfortunately, the website is only in Norwegian at the moment, uh, which makes it a little more difficult. Um, so, there is one other thing I'd like to briefly touch on. You will have received uh, submissions from Calendar McDowell and and. There are all sorts of other debates about the science behind this. Is there an effect? Can we show an effect on wild populations and so on? Marine Scotland Science, the uh, government's fishery scientist, has produced a very useful five-page summary of the science document. Um, and I, I will, if I may, just read the conclusions from that document. Um, the clerks have a copy, and I, I hope we'll be able to circulate it to the committee after this meeting. But it, it, it says, in summary, that 
salmon aquaculture can result in elevated numbers of sea lice in open water and hence is likely to increase the infestation potential on wild salmonids. This in turn could have an adverse effect on populations of wild salmonids in some circumstances. The magnitude of any such impact in relation to overall mortality levels is not known for Scotland. However, concerns that there may be a significant impact of aquaculture have been raised due to declines in catches of both salmon and sea trout on the Scottish west coast. There is scientific evidence that individual Scottish sea trout can experience physiological detrimental burdens of salmon lice in areas with salmon aquaculture, but the effects on populations in different areas is not known. Scientific evidence from Norway and from Ireland indicates that early protection against salmon lice parasitism results in reduced absolute marine mortality, increasing recapture rates of experimental salmon and reducing the time spent at sea, indicating that salmon lice can influence the population status of wild salmon. I'd just like to read that last bit again. It, salmon lice can influence the population level of wild salmon. Now that's the conclusion, not of us, and not of the aquaculture body, but of Marine Scotland Science. Now if they are able to conclude that, we would say we need a precautionary approach. We need as strict, strict control as possible on sea lice from Scottish aquaculture in order to protect what is rightly uh, an extremely valuable um, asset for Scotland. That's the wild salmonid population. Um, only this month, uh, at, uh, the North Atlantic Salmon Conservation Organisation met in Germany. Scotland was represented and came forward, the Scottish Government came forward with proposals for thre higher thresholds for escalation plans and potentially reducing biomass at farms. But the levels at which those uh, steps would take, would, would take effect, uh, are much higher than all the other aquaculture nations represented thought was sensible. Scotland's system is recognised as being the most lax in terms of control of sea lice compared to the Norwegians, compared to the Irish and so on. Uh, and we'd like to see that tightened up and brought into line, frankly, with, with the other um, salmon farming producing nations. So uh, without going into any more detail, I'd like to conclude that our, our petition asks for a statutory duty to be placed on Scottish ministers to regulate farmed fish for the express purpose of protecting wild fish. At the moment, all the legislation is pointed at the, the health and welfare of the farmed animal, not of the wild fish. Um, we think the minister should have a duty, should have the requisite powers, and we would like to see the relocation programme, identifying those farms that are in the wrong place We'd like to see that rejuvenated. It rather ran into the sand in 2008 and hasn't gone very much further. Um, we believe if that could be done, there's an awful lot of progress that can be made. Now, to finish off, I'd like to just put on the record, Salmon and Trout Conservation Scotland is not trying to shut down the aquaculture industry. We are not in that business. We get accused of it a lot of, uh, a lot of times. We recognise just how important aquaculture is to Scotland. What we'd like to do is, is make it more sustainable so that wild fish can thrive alongside the industry. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks very much for that. Thank you. Um, can I bring in Angus MacDonald to begin the question? Okay. Uh, thank you, convener. Good morning, uh, Mr. Donnelly Adams. Good morning, Mr. Graham Stewart. Um, you, you'll be aware that during the debates on um, aquaculture and fisheries bill in 2013, it was agreed uh, that uh, the data on sea lice would be published voluntarily by the industry. Um, now, in, in, in 30 areas, or, or thereabouts. Um, now, um, that has been done, um, and in fact, uh, as, as was promised to the Iraqi committee at the time, uh, the industry have been reporting back on a three-monthly uh, basis to the to the individual members of the committee, which uh, wh which which was helpful. Um, now, you've mentioned um, Norway, which is clearly the nearest comparator country. Uh, to Scotland with regard to the, the salmon industry. Uh, perhaps Chile is the next uh, closest comparator. Um, you've mentioned that uh, there's, there have been some developments in Norway uh, where they've issued, they're now issuing farm by farm 
uh, data that uh, was clearly called for by a number of people, uh, stakeholders, when uh, the evidence sessions were, were taking place in this place um, in 2013. Um, clearly, these, these are more robust uh, methods than, than we have here in Scotland. Um, why do you think the, the, the farm by farm data is not being released um, publicly? And, and uh, do you believe that that information is available for a start? Strangely, in certain regions, it is only by virtue of the fact that one or two of the regions only have a single farm in them. So the aggregated data is obviously related to the one farm. So in, in, in some respects, it's unfair on those operators that they are clearly um, identified. Um, I, think, I think the industry uh, does feel that its data is its data and it shouldn't have to share it. And, and I think in, in some respects there is a, uh, there is a sort of a principle, a higher level principle that, you know, why should we share this data with everyone? Um, and they are concerned that particular farms will be singled out. And I'm sure that's, uh, I'm sure that's that's uh, in the forefront of their mind. But in order to identify farms that have problems, that, that need relocation, and, and a lot of these farms are the er very early farms that were initially put in the sheltered bays in the mouths of estuaries and so on because it was a new industry, because it was easier to control the cages if they were you know, close to land, if they were sheltered and so on. It's those farms that quite often have the problems. And if we can identify those farms, talk to the local authorities, talk to the industry, identify sites where they could be moved to, away from... Because the problem is, when they're in the mouths of the river, they're in the migratory channels for the wild salmonids. Um, if you're moving offshore into open water, and the, and, the, and the kit these days, the cages, enable that to happen, then you, you know, not only can you get away from the interaction with the wild salmonids, actually you can probably increase your biomass as well because you're out further, you've got better flow of water and so on. So... The publication of farm-specific data will enable us to identify more clearly those farms that, that, that we'd like to put forward for, re for relocation. Do, do you understand the, the, the industry's concerns that um, the issue of farm-by-farm -farm data could have uh, serious consequences on, on the viability of a farm if, uh, if, if that information was widely received? Widely, well, to an extent, I, I, I understand why, but... but, uh, but I'm not entirely sure why it, it would be correct to shelter a poorly performing farm from scrutiny just because it might cause them an issue. Um, to, to, to give you an indication, most of the supermarkets don't name the farm of production. Sainsbury's are different, the co-op are different. They do name the farm on the front of the package uh, of, the, the, of the smoke, um, smoked salmon products that they sell. Um, but an awful lot don't. An awful lot of ready meals and so on don't identify the farm of origin. So I don't think that we're in a situation where you're going to get consumer pressure building out against a particular farm, having any particular impact on, on that farm. Okay. As you know, enforcement notices can be served on individual farms. What do you know about the enforcement uh, regime? Notices by the, from the Fish Health Inspectorate? Yeah. Yes. That they can indeed serve notices, enforcement notices, a variety of different notices, but the purpose of those notices is to protect the health and welfare of the farmed animal. Now, you can get a situation, particularly in the second year of production, where the farmed fish can tolerate 10, 15 adult female lice quite happily because they're about to be harvested. It doesn't cause an economic problem for the farmer. But while those fish are in the last few months of their, their life in, in the cages with these lice on, they're producing a large number of juvenile lice that are leaving the, the, leaving the cages uh, and impacting on the wild fish. So the fish health inspector come along, a fish has got a, a collection of adult female lice on, but it's not causing a, a, a health and welfare issue for the farmed animal. They can't act. They don't have the legal powers to act expressly for the purpose of protecting wild fish. Um, you state in your petition that you, you've met with Marine Scotland uh, on a number of occasions, yes. and I think it's fair to say you're not impressed, um, given you state that there's been a lack of progress in protecting uh, wild salmonids from harm caused by the, the, the industry. Um, what more do you believe that Marine Scotland uh, should be doing to address the issue? Well, I, I think Marine Scotland does suffer from the same 
situation is the Fish Health Inspectorate, and their, their focus is still largely the health and welfare of the farmed animal. Um, uh, and the, um, the responsibility, for, responsibility for the wild fish is falling between two stools. Um, Scottish Environment Protection Agency just deals with the water pollution side of things. Uh, Scottish Natural Heritage will only involve itself with those European protected areas, the SACs. So the vast majority of fish farms are nowhere near the SACs. And so there, there is a gap in the law. There is not an, an agency responsible. I, I, I wouldn't say that we are universally appalled by Marine Scotland. Far from it. The staff are excellent, and we have a very good and, and, and quite jovial relationship with them. Um, but obviously they, they, they have a particular line to steer, and, and we have ours, and we, we do make progress with them. Okay, that's, that's good to hear. Um, you, you've made a general statement that uh, wild salmonid, salmonids in the aquaculture zone on Scotland's west coast are in trouble. Um, but is it not the case that uh, they're in trouble across the whole of the North Atlantic region, uh, not just our west coast? And the decline in numbers was identified long before uh, the salmon industry increased to the size that we see today. Could, could I ask Andrew to deal yes. with that? I mean, wild salmon... Um, face three problems in Scotland. One is um, declining uh, marine survival, and that's universal, east, west, north. Um, the uh, netting uh, has influenced uh, the uh, level of re returns to rivers, uh, the decline in netting. Um, but also aquaculture has influenced matters. And if one, we just recently did a, a new study of the uh, salmon rod catches uh, in Scotland, uh, and the catches in the salmon farming heartland of the west coast lag far behind those of the essentially farm-free east coast. The five-year average catch for the east coast, that's between the Tweed and Cape Roth, uh, was up by 40% between 1970 and 2014. Uh, in contrast, the five-year average for the West Coast, that's from Cape Roth down to the Mull of Kintar, including the Hebrides, which is the main salmon farming area, uh, the catch there declined by 2014 to 76% of its 1970 value. If the West Coast catches had tracked the East, then catches would have been 80% higher in 2014. In the worst area, that's Ardna Merkin down to Kintyre, the rod catch was by 2014 50% of its 1970 value. And I, you know, I emphasise again that in the East Coast, it's actually because of the decline in netting gone up by 40%. Um, the great majority of West Coast rivers are now in what is called Category 3, which is the new government uh, classification of salmon rivers, uh, which means that. Uh, according to the Scotland's um, own marine scientists, no exploitation of salmon is sustainable. Um, and I would also make the one other point that um, recent extinctions of salmon uh, in Scotland have only occurred uh, in the West Highlands and Islands. And I can give examples, specific examples of, of extinctions. We've got no similar uh, extinctions on the, either the east or the north coast. And moving on, just to one other point, sea trout. Sea trout, which are incredibly important to the um, rod fishing tourist industry in the West Coast and, and the islands, they've been hit far harder than salmon. And all the large sea trout on which you know, such fisheries depend um, have gone. They just, just don't exist anymore. And we're talking fish of three and a half pounds and th these brought in many many thousands of anglers between June and September to the west coast and the islands where you know, tourism is very very important and that whole tourism industry in terms of sea trout has gone it's absolutely collapsed whereas you, there's no there's been a decline in sea trout in the east and north coast but nothing like the decline um, I I in the west coast thank you okay Rona Mr Lindley Adams, hello. Um, just to go back to Marine Scotland and to follow on from my colleague, um, you'll be aware that they've been able to inspect farms since 2007. Are you saying that that's, they're ineffective, that they're not doing their job properly? Not that they're not doing their job properly, but they're inspecting for the purpose of checking the, the animal, uh, the, the welfare and the health of the farmed animal, the farmed fish. 
So when they look at the, the, the parasite control, the sea lice control on the farm, they're, they're judging it as against the health of the farmed fish. And if the farmed fish are okay, then the farm is okay and there's no need for any, any sort of enforcement action. What we're saying is that you can have a situation, and it happens quite regularly, where large farmed fish have a few parasites, the health and welfare of that farmed fish is not threatened, but that is still causing a very severe threat mm -hmm. to the wild salmon is going past. So, mm -hmm. so Marine uh, Scotland's Fish Health Inspector are doing a very good job, and, and, um, but they are doing it within the constraints of their legal responsibilities. Because okay. I was just going to ask, is it too big a job for them then to do the wild fish as well? Is that just out with their... Scope or they're legally they can't do yeah. that. Is that what well, saying? legally they can't do right. it. Okay. I, I, and certainly they have the expertise. They 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 know what they're looking at when they okay. go onto a farm. They yeah. they they you know, a yeah. lot of them yeah. will have spent many many hours bobbing right. around but on the cages. It's so not they, in their remit to do it. It's not in their legal remit at okay. the moment. No. Okay. The other point I wanted to ask you was, um, can you clarify what evidence you've got that that's, that 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 the um, some fish farms are not complying with the code of industry. Um, what? How do you know that they're not doing that well, properly? Well, the the aggregated sea lice data that's produced by the Scottish Salmon Producers Organisation three years in, in arrear, uh, sorry, three months in arrears, mm -hmm. shows particular regions uh, that are way over the code of good practice threshold. Um, okay. So the threshold is is either one or 0.5 mm -hmm. average adult female lice per fish, depending on what time of year you're, you're at. If they're up at 10, then you can be sure that within that collection of farms in a region, some at least must be not hitting the threshold, not keeping the sea lice numbers below the threshold. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, the code of practice requires farmers to treat for lice when they hit the threshold. Advises. Uh, uh, sorry, advises, you're quite right. Yes. Um, you can then look, a, look at the data the Scottish Environment Protection Agency publishes on the Scotland's aquaculture database, and that lists when treatments are applied under particular control activities regulations licenses and if you marry the two together you can find regions where lice numbers are way over the threshold average lice numbers but none of the farms appear to be treating the implication must be that they're not responding to the voluntary code of good practice it's it's very difficult to say a particular farm because we don't have farm specific data but within an aggregation of 10 15 farms you can say yeah, pretty okay, clearly. So, so what you're saying is specific monitoring is, is not is not available, it's not coming up to scratch? It's not publicly available. It's not publicly it is there. Available. There, there. There is a thing called the record keeping order. Okay. So fish farmers have to keep their own records for inspection okay. by the Fish Health Inspectorate. Okay. Unfortunately, because they're held by the farmers and they're not held by Scottish Government, by the Marine Scotland, right. they're not accessible through freedom of information, okay. environmental information regulations. Okay. They're held by the farmers ready for inspection okay. but not provided. All right, thank you. Yep. Sorry, can I just add one something to what Ron Mackay has just been uh, alluding to, and also what Angus MacDonald mentioned uh, about five minutes ago, is that, um, yes, clearly it, enforcement notices may be served, but they don't seem to do any good. And one example of that was in late 2014, the area by Kyle of La Cauche, um, the average number of adult female lice per farm fish went up from around 10 to 15 to 20 and finally ended up at 40. Now by that point, um, I mean, when, it went, when they went to slaughter, I mean, they wouldn't have needed skinning the fish. I mean, they, they, they would, can't have had any skin left. But for the farm fish, that was deemed to be acceptable. Uh, one imagines that uh, the Fish Health Inspectorate uh, sent out enforcement notice, notices, but that nothing happened. They just can't continued. This is Marine Harvest with their farms by Cook, Kyle of the Cows. Continued until such point as they decided to, to, to slaughter. Uh, uh, at 40, I mean, the number of juvenile lice that would have been produced is mind-boggling. I may have missed this in the papers. Is there a, a treatment for this, for sea lice, or do, is it slaughter? Is, is the only remedy? Or? There, there are a variety of treatments. Yeah. Most of them are, are, are chemical-based. There is an in-feed treatment, so something actually in the feed, mm -hmm. but most of them are, are, are bath-type treatments. So you, you, they hang a, an impermeable tarpaulin around the cage, put, it's usually an organophosphate or a pyrethroid-based pesticide mm -hmm. in the water 
leave it for a couple of hours, then just open the open the tarpaulins and, and it washes away. And in that two hours, the, the OP or the pyrethroid mm -hmm. kills the lice and they fall mm -hmm. off the fish. Um, you, it, it's it's a very difficult process. It, it's it's tough an expensive work. process. It is an expensive process. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and it's it, I, I like to say it is tough work. The operatives you know have to lug these tarpaulins around uh, in goodness knows what sort of weather conditions. It's not easy. Okay. Yeah, treating sea lice in the Faroes, the figures came out just recently. It cost the farmers in the Faroes about uh, half a euro per kilo of fish. It's, it's, it's a substantial cost. But the problem we've got with sea lice is that they're developing an immunity, like any parasite, you know, they d develop immunities. And most of the chemical treatments in many areas no longer work. And that's why they're trying things like cleaner fish, that's RAS. But they're, they're, the success of RAS is very patchy. Where we've seen RAS introduced, we've actually then seen the sea lice numbers increasing. It, it, it's, a, it's a major problem, and obviously the farmers have got their problems, but whilst they've got their problems, the, the impact continues on wild fish. And all we're really asking for is for those farms where sea lice are out of control, something is done to make those farmers you know, slaughter early, cull early, or take drastic action to prevent... You know, large numbers spreading into the environment. I'm going to take just one last set of questions from Brian Whittle, and then we'll need to draw this to a conclusion. I'm just going to have a quick follow-on question for what uh, from the other. I wanted to ask if the pesticides or the chemicals used in the treatment uh, is any danger to any other sea life? Well, uh, I, I started out my association with, with, with aquaculture as a research student at what was then the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries in Scotland, the lab in Aberdeen. This is going back early 991, uh, and um, yes, there, there is strong evidence of resistance to the pesticides in non-target organisms. Um, they're also extremely toxic to crustacea. Um, that, that's what they're designed to do. They kill sea lice. Sea lice are a crustacean. Um, so are lobsters, so are crabs, so are prawns, so anything like that in the immediate vicinity. When the tarpaulins are removed, it can have a negative effect there, uh, and there are examples of where Creel fishermen are, 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 are alarmed by what they s believe is a, a um, drop in stock of their their quarry because of the location of fish farms. But that, that's so you suggest then culling is really the most realistic. I think ultimately, yeah. ultimately it's close containment. So raising farmed fish in a way that is completely biologically separated from the wild fish. And, and marine harvester are investing quite a amount of money in. In, uh, they've got two projects, a donut project and an egg project. That's the shape of the, yeah. the creation. Um, they're big enough to invest the money, but it's, it, it's pointing in the right direction. And um, the quicker we get to closed containment, the better. It'll, it'll be better all round. And it'll reduce the costs of production dramatically because it's a costly business. I mean, to train people to run open net cages in pretty hostile weather conditions right the way around the year. It's, it's an expensive business. The petition calls for a threshold to be set on the number of sea lice and farmed fish, obviously preventing damage to wild fish. If this threshold is exceeded and the treatment is not successful, the petition states that farmers should have to harvest or, or uh, their fish or cull them. Uh, what evidence is there for adopting this approach and, and setting such thresholds? Well, the, the threshold exists in the, in the Code of Good Practice at the moment. The, 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 the subsequent culling or harvesting doesn't yet. Um, but this, this is practiced in Norway, where they get a severe problem. It, it, it doesn't often result in a formal notice because it's done informally. The Norwegian inspectors say, we will serve a notice if you don't do something here. So early culling, early harvesting is, is, is recognized as the industry of a way of ultimately dealing with the lice problem if it's gone out of control. Um, what we'd like to see is that that happens not just when it reaches a problem for the welfare uh, and the health and welfare of the farmed animal, but when it reaches the, uh, a problem stage for for wild fish. So, and, and that it's the gap between the two that mm. concerns us. Okay. The petition also refers to a relocation program in 2008 when it says it was al allowed to run to sand. What happened to that program, and did any of the fish farms get relocated? Well, relocating a fish farm is difficult, and we, we've suggested in the past that that. Scottish Government should look at whether it has the requisite legal powers to, to assist and facilitate relocation of farms because it, it, you know, it's, it's a long process to get planning permission for a fish farm. Fish farmers quite 
obviously won't want to relocate if they really don't have to because they've invested time and money and effort in getting the planning permission and the various consents for the farms in the first place. Um, but if we, if we can, and, and the farmers in their private moments will say, yeah, those, those aren't ideal farms. That's a particularly licey farm, that one. You know, and they'd love to be away from there because it makes their job easier. But it's, it's, there is difficulty in, in getting the consents and permissions, certainly. Uh, but we wouldn't, we wouldn't be objecting if, if you know, proper relocation occurred. I just asked finally, um, you've said already that you, you think there should be renewed focus on moving to containment of all farmed salmon in Scotland, like they should be kept in tanks, presumably. Um, I wonder if you can, if you have any information about an approach like this being adopted in other countries, and whether you've got any sense of what that would cost. I mean, yes, certainly there are there are closed containment farms in operation in various locations, and um, perhaps if I can provide written information to the committee after today, there the, are certainly Norwegian examples and. and um, fish farming journals, every other week there's another story about a successful closed containment operation starting up here, there and everywhere. And, and it, they, um, I think ultimately it's bound to come in because if you've got a closed containment site, particularly if you've got one on land, you don't have to have well boats. You don't have to train your staff in you know, detailed health and safety procedures involving working at sea. You don't have to have all that life-saving equipment. You don't have the difficulties of operating in, a, in, a, in, a, in the severe marine environment. Um, presumably then, when they made the choice to have fish farms as they are now, rather than the way you describe, despite all of that, the downside of it, they must have regarded that as better than the option you're now proposing. Why would that be? I think it, at the time it was the only option. I don't think people believe that closed containment w was possible, but the technologies have moved on. We've been farming trout on riversides in closed containment for years, um, but uh, doing it for salmon is more difficult, but it's, you know, the technologies have moved on and, and you know, commend Marine Harvest for the amount of work they're doing on it. Okay. The, initial, sorry, the initial capital cost for closed containment is substantial, but once you know, th that has been paid for, the ongoing running costs are much reduced compared to the open net systems. Do you get any sense of the view of, the, of fish farmers as a community about that kind of approach? Uh, marine harvest are certainly very, very keen, and they're, they're investing very large sums in uh, research into closed containment, various systems in Norway. Uh, you know, major programs are happening. Okay. Well, thanks for that. And I think we've, we've probably concluded the questions we would have. What we now need to think about um, is whether people have any comments or suggestions about where we go next um, and any next steps we might wish to take. Angus? Um, convener, thanks. Uh, I think um, I'd, I'd certainly be keen to, to hear the views of Marine Scotland and the Scottish Government. SEPA, uh, the Scottish Salmon Producers Organisation, the Atlantic Salmon Trust, and the Association of Salmon Fisheries Boards. Um, but uh, g given um, some of the evidence that we, we heard earlier on, I'd be keen to hear from the appropriate Norwegian Ministry with regard to the farm-by-farm -farm data system that they've introduced. Uh, or perhaps we could ask Spice to, to look into that for us. Um, okay, I think that would be useful to get a sense of what's happening in, mm. in other places. We presume we're wrestling with the same problems and trying to get that balanced right. Are those um, suggestions from Angus agreed? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Anything to add to that? No? Okay, in that case, can I thank you very much for your attendance today and we will um, pursue the actions that have been described there and I'll suspend the meeting until... Well, thanks very much.
Okay, thank you very much. And if I can call us back to order again, we are now going to deal with Petition 1602 on ECGs and heart echo tests within antenatal care. The second new petition before us this morning is by Carol Sunnox, and I welcome you here tonight. Can I ask you to make a brief opening statement of no more than five minutes, and then we'll move on to questions. Okay. Thank you. Can I firstly say I've never done anything like this before, so if I say anything in this, you know, talk, I, you know, I, I don't know. But good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for inviting me along to speak to the petitions committee. Back in 2007, I discovered in March that I was expecting a baby. Shock was an understatement. At the point, I was working full-time with Women's Aid, providing support to children who came to refuge due to domestic violence. I was also studying part-time for a postgraduate diploma in play therapy, so getting pregnant didn't feature in my plans. On the 1st of April, I was admitted to my local A&E with excruciating pain. After tests, I was told I was suffering from ectopic pregnancy, and they believed I was pregnant with twins, one in the womb and one in the floppian tube. I remained in hospital over the next few days, and on the 4th of April, they decided I needed surgery. And during the procedure, I lost the baby who was growing in my womb. A discharge, I was told, due to my age and the situation with me losing a fallopian tube, it would become increasingly difficult for me to get pregnant. In June 2007, myself, my husband and my parents went on holiday for two weeks. On returning, a few weeks later, I discovered I was once again, against all odds, pregnant. I was now in a position to have my rainbow baby and was very excited and happy. For many women, pregnancy brings various changes in the body. But after the first few weeks, many women flourish and bloom. They glow with a little life that's growing inside them. Only that never happened to me. From very early on, I had an awful pregnancy. Never did I glow or flourish, but I did have all the conditions that come with pregnancy, including heartburn, morning sickness, although this should be named all day sickness. I was constantly tired and really struggling with the pregnancy. My treatment was consulting laid due to my history, so visits to local maternity was very frequent. At this time, not only was I pregnant, but I was due to be married in November of 2007. My ankles had begun to swell at a very early stage of my pregnancy. I developed cholestatus. This is a body itch that affects everywhere 24-7 and is a sign of possible liver problems during pregnancy, but there is no treatment for it. The swelling in my ankles continued and it got to a point that I had to wear a size 7 or an 8 in a shoe. I'm actually a size 5. I presented with the swelling at the antenatal clinic on numerous occasions, but was told all my condition, conditions were due to being pregnant. They would always check baby's heartbeat, and I received more ultrasounds than normal, but all was to check how my beautiful baby was doing. Never at any point did anyone think to check me. During the last few months of pregnancy, I was struggling more and more every day. I still had the severe swelling. I had trouble lying down and sleeping, so I had to prop myself up with pillows. And I went to see my GP as I felt I had some sort of chest infection and was given antibiotics. I had a cough and noisy breathing. It got so bad that I in fact used my Hudson's inhaler to try and get a breath. I was really struggling. 27th of March 2008, at 10pm, I went into labour, one week early. My baby was born at 10.01 on Friday the 28th of March. Soon after having my baby, I developed a sharp pain in my back. I couldn't continue to hold my newborn. I asked my mum to take him. The nurses came over and it was at that point they knew something wasn't right. For the next three hours, I was sick, with extremely high blood pressure, causing pain in my head. At this point, they were talking about many possibilities that could be the cause of my deterioration. They thought preeclampsia, HELP syndrome, and also a blood clot. After many tests over the next few hours, they decided I'd move to coronary care, as they suspected I'd suffered a cardiac episode. So 12 hours after giving birth to my angel, I was transferred, leaving my baby with the midwives at the special care unit. In the morning, a cardiologist came to see me to tell me they believed I developed postpartum cardiomyopathy. Peri or postpartum cardiomyopathy is a form of dilated cardiomyopathy that is described as the deterioration in cardiac function. It typically presents in the last few months of pregnancy and up to six months after. It normally causes a decrease of the left ventricular ejection fraction. This results in the heart muscle not being able to contract forcefully enough to pump adequate amounts of blood to vital organs, resulting in arrhythmias, blockage of blood vessels by clot, and in some cases, sudden cardiac death. PPCM is diagnosed is a diagnosis of exclusion, but mothers have no prior history of heart disease and there's no other known possible cause of heart failure. Unfortunately, many doctors dismiss the early symptoms because they appear to be typical, typical of normal pregnancy, yet early detection and treatment are critically important to the patient. Delays in diagnosis and treatment are associated with increased deaths in new mothers. 
Although many women will present with evidence of having a clot that's passing between the heart and other vital organs, causing such complications as a stroke, the blockage of an artery or sometimes a heart attack. This is why during pregnancy doctors should always hold high suspicions of PPCM in any peri or post-patient post where persistent or unexplained symptoms occur. One of the most effective ways to diagnose PPCM is by having a BNP blood test. BNP is a naturally occurring signalling hormone in the blood and is produced by the human heart muscle. It simply shows that anything that increases mechanically stress in the heart or irritates the heart muscle will trigger the heart's pressure receptors to release BNP into the blood. Although increased BNP does not always signify heart failure and should never be used in isolation, it's a very effective indicator that other avenues need to be looked at. This can include an ECG. In other countries, there is also an early detection checklist. This is used as a point scoring tool and again, again can be used in early detection when women present with unexplained symptoms. A quarter to a third of PPCM patients are young women who give birth for the first time. It's thought one in every 1,300 pregnant women will develop PPCM. Today is not for me, it's too late for me. I can't have any more children, but I do have two beautiful nieces who will hopefully one day become mums. Every one of us in here today has a daughter, sister, friend, niece who has the potential of becoming a pregnant. Please don't let them experience what I did. After moving on to coronary care, I didn't see my son for 12 days. During this time, he became unwell with a corneal atresium which is extra bone grown over one of his nostrils, they couldn't breathe properly. And at one point they were looking to transfer him to the children's hospital. As a mum, this broke my heart. I missed out so much during the early time. The bonding between mother and child is so special and can never be replaced. My son was almost three, almost three weeks old before I got to take him home. Don't let this situation, don't let this be a situation that other mums, young mums experience. Having PPCM left me tired, underweight, and I found it difficult to not only care for myself, but also my son. And now, eight years down the line, I still take medication. Surely early detection is a must, and we must consider the possibility of being able to diagnose PPCM early and effectively. And I've got a kind of checklist here that they use, you know, when they appear um, at the doctors. Um, and really, that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Indeed, that was very, very um, helpful and very uh, clear. What we'll do now is just ask you um, some questions, really to clarify what you think are the best things that should be done as a consequence of your experience. I suppose the first thing I'd, I, I would be interested in knowing is whether is what you're asking for is that if somebody has symptoms, um, either unexplained, which may be PPCM, you then get a diagnostic test as opposed to screening all pregnant women? Yeah. Not, not every woman will present. I mean, there is things that are associated with pregnancy that present with PPCM, like the swelling of the ankles, um, maybe shortness of breath at the end, stuff like that. But when women are at a point where they can't lie down, they've got to prop themselves up. I mean, as I'm saying, I went to the doctor saying, <coughs> thinking I had a chest infection and it was, it was heart failure. Um, and I was presenting with a lot of different things. So I think even the, po the point scoring um, checklist that they have, um, it's a list of five or six questions where they say, do you have problems breathing lying down? You know, one being the worst and five being okay. And then if it's over that point scoring of four or five, they then refer you on to get an ECG, which would then actually show them that the, you know, the, the, the left side of the heart wasn't working. Do you think there's a lack of awareness of the condition itself, which would mean people wouldn't even know what to look for? Yes. Whether that might be the answer? When I had when I had Kai and, and I was in, um, I was kept in the maternity delivery room because they didn't know what was wrong with me, and um, they had the paddles and stuff outside because they thought my heart was going to, you know, it was just a horrible time. But there was two midwives who sat with me, and the midwife said to me, "We've never been with anybody who's who's had anything like this. They had never seen anything like it." So there would be an awareness raising question for um, health professionals. Um, and do you think there's a, a more general point that um, pregnant women, the, the professionals see the baby and not the mum? I do. I think um, I think they see uh, the pregnant lady as being the vessel that's carry, carrying this way, you know, and put in it as a, the babies are so important, but there's no point in the vessel being OK if, if you know, if the, you know, if that's not going to be able to carry the baby for for full term, I mean the um, the doctors, you know, when you go in, it's all. I mean, I, I was so well throughout the full pregnancy and, and the swelling and stuff, and I was 
I mean, I was up and down to the maternity unit and it was just, you know, they don't tell you about it when you go to your antenatal classes. They don't say, look out for this, look out for that. You know, they tell you about all the nice things that happen. Do you know, you can say, or you might end up, but I mean, it was, I mean, I've got a friend who actually died in the November of 2007. Um, she went to hospital complaining of chest pains and they were saying, what's indigestion you've got? And it ended up she had a heart attack and she died and her baby was born. Uh, baby lived, but she died. And there was another woman who I speak to regularly on a I'm kind of part of quite a lot of cardiomyopathy website pages. And one woman's 21 year old daughter died four weeks after giving birth, and they still didn't know until after she died that it was PPCM that she had. And there's so many women as well who end up needing. I mean, I've been lucky. I on medication, and um, I kind of recovered <laughs> relatively quickly. But um, there's so many women as well who need to go on and get pacemakers and stuff fitted. Okay, I mean, I think that there has been an issue that's been raised in the Parliament before over a period of time around cardiomyopathy and, um, and the heart condition more generally and awareness of GPs and so on about what to look for in early stages and the whole question of screening of families and so on, which is a whole other area that we could look at. But I think that the points you've made have been very useful. Rona? Yeah. Um, hello, Carol. Yeah. Um, just to say, the, the European <coughs> Society of Cardiology Working Group um, do recommend that, that um, women have ECGs, etc., at this stage, uh, in the early stages of pregnancy. Is it your opinion that the staff that were caring for you weren't aware of this? D there was never, ever going to be a possibility of you getting that at any time during your, your, your symptoms? There was never anything mentioned to me about, oh, there might be a problem with your heart. Mm -hmm. Never at any time. There was never, um, you know, when you go in and, and you, you go up and whatever you're presenting with, mm -hmm. you take you around to the the early baby unit, baby's monitored straight away. Um, the, the most to do is take your blood pressure, um, mm -hmm. but never at any time was there anything, you know, spoken mm -hmm. about. Oh well, let's have a wee look and see. Do you know if there's something else mm -hmm. going on here? Yeah. When you, do you know, pregnancy is not an illness. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't be ill during your pregnancy. And when a woman is presenting as being ill, mm -hmm. then they need to be looking at something. Yeah. You know. So, so going back to what the community is saying, it's really about awareness as as well of the staff that these are the guidelines that they should be following. Yes. And and that's what you're you're trying to stress so that so that this does happen. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Just saying that the, the, there's so few cases identified. Uh, I'm just looking here at the numbers. Of, it's so small. So presumably, what we're saying here is that uh, there's a lack of identification. Yeah, so I mean, you think there's a lot more. There's a lot more cases than are, than are actually identified. Yep, yeah, the, the amount of women who I, I speak to on these websites and stuff like that, who have gone on, had their baby, became extremely ill, and not been diagnosed for many months after. I mean, it's not that they. I mean, they say that it can. The onset of it can be up to six months after you've had your baby. You typically find the onset is there way before that, but it's not been diagnosed to six months after it, after women have been readmitted into hospital and then they've found they've started to look for other things because the pregnancy can't be used as an excuse for the, the symptoms that they're showing. So that's, and then by that time, you've had six months being with your baby where you've been totally ill, tired, and then you've also got the, the possible risk of, of it be, you know, being a sudden death. And it happens, it's... You know, and when it does happen, it's normally um, just put down to sudden adult death. You know, they, and there's there's not a lot of um, you know stuff that's that's said about that. It's just done, and that's it. But unfortunately, for for many families, you know, it's about they lose they lose the mum and their wife. Thank you. Anyone else? No. Um, I think we've concluded our questions, and wonder we want to think about how we can take this petition forward. I think we should write to the Scottish Government to ask its view on it and mm -hmm. um, explain what we've, we've heard today. I wondered if there's any value in maybe, I don't know who, who would be the relevant um, medical professional body to ask them what their specialist. Mm -hmm. well, midwifery. Mm -hmm. midwifery. And, board for and whether for GPs, if there's shared care, whether they're aware of yeah. it. We could maybe take advice on who the best people to ask what they're. What would their expectation would be of any professional in the circumstances that you describe <coughs> would be? Um, and I think that would be useful. Is that agreed then? Okay, okay so we'll, we'll write to Scottish Government directly about their views on your petition and we'll also um, look to professional medical bodies to see um, perhaps what they think could be done to ensure that your, your people don't end up in the situation that yeah. you've been in. 
So can I thank you very much for your attendance and we'll suspend the meeting for a couple of minutes. Thank you. the meeting together again and we now have to consider two further uh, new petitions and the first one is PE 1600 on speed awareness courses. This next new petition is by John Chapman. Mr Chapman is calling for the introduction of speed awareness courses as an alternative to other penalties for drivers who are found to be speeding. Members will have had a chance to read the petition, the briefing note and an additional submission from Mr Chapman. Um, so I would really just want to ask people's views on what action we may wish to take on this petition. Can Angus? We, um, yes, I think we should write to the Scottish Government to request an update on the assessment uh, of whether speed awareness courses would make an effective additional contribution to, to road safety in Scotland. <coughs> Any other views? Just, sorry, no, I was just going to say maybe one of the um, automobile associations or the, the car, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the name would be, but you know the RAC or some, one of the people that do um, monitoring and things. Mm -hmm. We could contact the RAC and a, 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 just, the organisations tend to, to get their view. speak on yeah. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is something comparable, is there not, around, um, particularly for young drivers, if they're, if they're reckless driving and they, they go on a they go on a refresher course? Yeah, or? Oh, there's an advanced driving uh -huh. course, but this is a bit different, but yeah. we probably need some expert views on it, I think. You, you, you get the, more and more now you're getting the opportunity to not get three points on your licence if you're willing to attend you know, a, course, a speed awareness course. I'd be interested to see how that impacts. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Okay, so I think if we can agree then with uh, Angus Macdonald's suggestion that we do write to the Scottish Government um, to get an update on their assessment of the benefits of such an approach. Is that agreed? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. And we can then move on to um, Petition 1601 on European Beavers in Scotland. The final new petition today is by Andy Miles and relates to protection for populations of European beavers in Scotland. Again, members will have had a chance to read the petition and the briefing note, and I welcome people's views. Angus? Um, yeah, I think it's fair to say that a number of NGOs have been expecting a, an imminent decision for some time <laughs> on, on this. Um, certainly, uh, it had been expected that there would be an announcement from the Scottish Government um, before uh, Parliament was dissolved in the last session. So um, I think, yeah, as a matter of urgency, we should write to the Scottish Government to seek uh, their views on the petition, firstly, and also get a timeline as to when they expect the announcement to be made, because it's, there's a number of people out there with vested interests who, who want to know. I think if that's agreed, I think there is a sense that it's, it's we want to know, um, you know the response of the Scottish Government to the, the petition, but specifically um, on their own commitment to make an announcement, it would be useful for that to be done sooner rather than later. Yeah. That's agreed? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. If we can move on then. Agenda item two. The second item on our agenda is consideration of 11 petitions that have been carried forward from session four. For each petition, we've received a briefing note and copies of submissions that have been received since the petitions were considered by our predecessors. And my intention is to go through each petition in turn and invite comments from members on the action that we may wish to take. And we're very aware, I think, that in all of these there are still, um, obviously the petitioners have strong views and have retained um, communication with the committee on these matters. 
So the first one we're going to look at is Petition 1319, Improving Youth Football in Scotland. The first continued petition is on improving youth fo football in Scotland and is from Willie Smith and Scott Robertson. And perhaps before we move on to discuss the petition, um, I should let members know that I am aware of this petition from my time as MSP for Glasgow Pollock and have known Willie Smith for many years in that capacity, not just in relation to the petition itself, but his work um, in youth football and specifically within the, that community. This is one of the oldest petitions that we have before us. And I think it's evident that a lot of useful work has been done on the petition. That said, I'm keen for us to make progress on the issues that remain outstanding and to be proactive in seeking views and information from relevant stakeholders. We can see that the SFA and the SPFL have outlined actions that they intend to take. And we also have a response, of course, from the Scottish Government in a letter from the Minister Aileen Campbell. The suggestion made is that time is given to see how these measures work before considering external regulation. That is from the government and SFA and SPFL. Um, and I think it would be useful to ask the government and SFA, SPFL, for information about a timetable for introducing these measures and assessing whether or not they are working. However, I think it's also fair to say that other stakeholders have a different view as to whether the measures that have been suggested adequately address the concerns raised in the petition. Um, and I think it would be also useful, therefore, to get views from the PFA Scotland and the Children's Commissioner, as well as organisations for youth and schools football. We know from correspondence that both the petitioner and others do not feel that actually the, the views of the Scottish Government and SFA and SPFL reflect what is actually happening at this stage. Um, so I would welcome any comments or suggestions from other members. <laughs> it's, um, I think I think football in particular has an issue. Um, this in, in the in the in the, uh, the turnover of children you know, under the age of sixteen through football clubs and um, and the way in which that's sometimes handled. It's always been a bit of a a concern um, in that uh, they identify kids as, as young as, you know, 9, 10, 11 years old and cull them, you know, on, a, on, a, on an annual basis. Um, and uh, I have a real, con a real concern on the impact that has on the, the kids themselves and their ability to participate, uh, not just in football, uh, but then after, afterwards how that they then can maybe move on to other sports. So, I mean, it's very general comment from me, but I don't think that uh, the, the current way in which many football clubs deal with youth is particularly particularly helpful. Okay. Do you think that this petition and what's involved in it will help that? Is that not what it's trying to do? Yeah, yeah, I, I, do I do think <coughs> I, I, I think it's, it's, it highlights um, or scratches the surface of what the issue is. Yeah. In this one here, I think uh, this, this is pertaining particularly to football, mm -hmm. but the impact that has across all activity, mm -hmm. uh, because because this this the kind of rejection that happens in football clubs for kids mm -hmm. um, has been you know anecdotally mm -hmm. uh, shown to have quite a, a, a negative impact mm -hmm. uh, on, on on youth across the board. And I, th I think the focus, I mean, there's been a whole number of issues that have been raised clearly through the petition, but the, the very live issues now remain the ability of clubs to take young people in one-year contracts, which end up to be three-year contracts, where they're not being paid, um, but they're also not allowed to play for the local teams. And I know that one of the things that exercise the petitioners is the idea that the club retains a right, or even in the suggestions that have been made by um, the SFA and SPFL, and the Scottish Government that um, they could still play for the clubs, but they're saying there should be a welfare clause. Well, if you give the club, the football club, a welfare clause, they're going to exercise that if they want to protect their own investment. Um, and I think maybe perhaps the issue, Brian, that you're referring to is also this bring in a whole number of children in order to get one who you think might be a star, reject the rest, yeah. and it puts them off sport, it's, doesn't allow them to be involved yeah. in active there's sport. There's, there's, again, there's quite a lot of... The, uh, uh, Kids, I just noticed there that they, they're only allowed to play for the club, but don't get a chance to play for the club. Yes. So they yeah. so that, I mean, kids at that age, what they want to do is, is kick a ball, yeah. mm -hmm. and they're not getting the opportunity to, to do that in a competitive environment. And I think you know, you know, 
how we deal with that uh, is that uh, I, I think if they're not getting a game, they're sitting on the bench. You know, if you're 13, 14, 15 years old and all you're doing is sitting on the bench, there has to be this welfare issue. Mm -hmm. uh, on, the, on the flip side of that, where they get the opportunity to, to, to play football, and I think. You and know, managing the tension of um, local football teams nurturing young people and then big clubs come in and just take them. Yeah. So there, there's a question about compensation. There's a lot of complicated mm -hmm. issues here, but my yeah. sense is from the petitioners, they do not feel that in the responses they've received, they're actually reflecting genuinely where these organisations are in terms of what's mm -hmm. to happen next. Um, in terms of actions, do you have specific proposals? I would agree with your suggestion that the, the you know the relevant um, people are, are are brought in and listened to, um, such as the you know the P PFA Scotland, the Scottish Schools Football Association, Youth Football, and and the our, our children, young people's commissioner to, to, to give to give their view. And we agreed that it would be worthwhile having an oral evidence session. In this I think so. Yeah. I think so. Yeah, it's, it's also, such a huge issue. I'd also think it might be an idea if we could. You know, give the clubs themselves an opportunity to uh -huh. put to put their yeah. case across. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting we bring in all of the PFL clubs in here, uh -huh. but one one you know one or two of them to, to, uh, to understand to what so. they're trying to do. Because my sense also is the tension for the SFA and the SPFL and others will know more about this than me. That they're at the mercy of what the clubs want, so they may have a policy, mm -hmm. but it's it's going to be for the clubs collectively yeah. to agree mm -hmm. to that, and that mm -hmm. may be a slightly more yeah. challenging mm -hmm. issue. I, mean, I think outcome-wise, it's it's welfare of the Children is it was paramount in this. Do the players' union play a part in that? Uh, not at that age, they don't. No, they don't. No. Okay. The, the, the players' union is quoted um, in Aileen Campbell's letter as having been actively engaged, but I think it would be worth checking with them what their level of engagement is. So I think it would be worthwhile, given the response we've had from the SFA, SPFL, and the minister to ask these other organisations how they would respond to that and, as, and, and take evidence, I think, um, get more information from the petitioners, as you've said, the Children and Young People's Commissioner, mm -hmm. PFA Scotland, the Scottish Football, Scottish Football mm -hmm. Association, the Scottish Youth Football Association, mm -hmm. with a view to having an oral evidence session at this stage. Angus? Yes, yeah, thanks. Uh, convener, yes, I totally agree with, uh, with the consensus there, but um, I think we... Can I just check with the clerks that... Uh, the letter dated the 27th of June from Real Grassroots is in public? OK. Um, well, I think um, clearly there's some concern uh, from uh, William Smith and Scott Robertson who are disputing a number of comments from the Minister, particularly claims that uh, the PFA Scotland has not been included in extensive discussions with Scottish Government officials. So, um, And the letter goes on to, to raise other concerns with regard to, to statements that are in the Minister's letter. So I would be keen um, to have the Minister's response to these um, co uh, disputed comments. Um, I think that would be helpful to help move the situation forward. OK, I think that's a, another excellent suggestion. I think we're clear this, this is something we want to continue looking at. And this gap between what the Minister believes to be the case and what you know, the petitioner and others believe to be the case is something we want to explore further. OK, thanks very much for that. If we can now move on to petition 1408, updating of pernicious anemia, vitamin B12 deficiency, understanding and treatment. The second continued petition is on updating of pernicious anemia and vitamin B12 deficiency, understanding and treatment, and is from Andrea MacArthur. This is also quite an old petition as resulted in some positive action being taken by the Scottish Government. The petitioners continue to correspond on what she feels are outstanding issues, and these are outlined in the briefing paper. Um, and so I would be interested in members' views on what the action the committee should take. Saying it's gen I mean, the, the traditional way of, of, of identifying this is just through a straightforward blood test and, and, and red blood cell count. Mm -hmm. uh, and can I welcome Elaine Smith to the committee? Thank you. It's just happened to know a bit about this. Um, and it is, and actually, it doesn't pick up 
the, for people who are very ill with it necessarily, and it's it's quite related to other issues like the thyroid problems and um, the, the whole endocrinological system as well, and it has some of the similar issues about diagnosis and, and treatment and not being picked up. Sorry, just just to clarify, it's it's in, in the, the, the really bad case cases of these. It's not being picked up when they're really ill. Well, um, it depends what you know. people would call really bad cases. For a lot of people, the blood test just doesn't pick it up at all, and it may be that they get iller and iller until finally... Uh, a lot of people are also take, going for private testing um, for the condition as well to make sure that it's been thoroughly explored. And if you're on other vitamins as well, like multivits <coughs> and things, then that can give a wrong reading from blood tests too. Yeah. I'm not a huge expert, I'm not a doctor. <laughs> But this is just my understanding, because I have looked into it. I think that with anemia, well, it's a red blood cell count. Uh, it's, yeah. it's pernicious anemia, though. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's and it's in families. It's a, it can be a genetic thing. My grandfather had it. My yeah. aunt has it. Okay, and, and the vitamin B12, is uh, the, the, the symptoms basically just seem to be tiredness, or can come across as tiredness, mm -hmm. can't they? That, 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 am I right? Sorry, I'm asking questions. Sorry, sorry convener, and I'm not a doctor, <laughs> but yeah, that, that's, I think in the, the briefing as well, the petitioner has, uh, I read it out of interest, the petitioner has um, outlined some of those symptoms, like yeah. uh, tiredness such that you wouldn't be able to work, very similar to uh, the undiagnosed underactive thyroid, actually. Yeah. actually yeah. It's the second stage testing that's, that's the question and following through, and my understanding was that subsequent to petitions and committee's involvement, um, the Scottish Haematology Society was involved in trying to draw up um, guidelines, but the Scottish Haematology Society, you have the papers, clearly they're not in a, a, a position to do such a substantial piece of work, yeah. and nor would we expect them to do so, and we were grateful for um, their involvement so far. So I suppose the question is really um, to ask the Scottish Government whether... You know, the summary document that was drafted by the Scottish Haematology Society has been finalised and provided to GPs in Scotland. This is about awareness to GPs of what they should do once there has been a diagnosis um, and whether that's going to be made, be published and made available to the public. Um, and I think it would be worth um, raising with the Scottish Government the specific concerns that have been raised by the petitioner regarding frequency of maintenance, injections and so on. Um, and the advice that provided GPs in Scotland on patients who consider they're receiving an inadequate level of injections. I think there's clearly something there that we should ask the Scottish Government to look at further. Yeah. If that's agreeable. Okay. Many thanks for that. And thanks to Elaine Smith for her advice. <laughs> um, <laughs> Can we move on then to petition 1463, effective thyroid and adrenal testing, diagnosis and treatment. The next continued petition is on thyroid and adrenal testing, diagnosis and treatment and is from Lorraine Cleaver. This is another petition that has been under consideration for several years and which the Scottish Government has done some work on. And there are still areas that we could explore as outlined in the briefing paper and I would therefore invite members' views on how the petition should be progressed. I don't maybe, Elaine, if you want to say something first, as somebody who's been involved with this petition has passed, it might help her. Certainly. Can, thanks, convener, um, and thank you for calling me to speak. Can I say, first of all, that the previous petitions committee did a, a huge amount of work on the petition. Um, they did seem to, to understand the issues very well, and also apologies that Lorraine Cleaver can't be here this morning. I think she's been to most other times that the petition was under, uh, under consideration. So... Um, I don't want to go over everything again with the petition, but um, there are, it is a big women's issue. It's predominantly women that it affects. Um, it's also, it also is a bit cross-cutting, so it's not just health as such, because um, issues like not being able to work through it, so there's economic issues as well, there's, there's issues of care, and it's a cross-cutting issue. But the fact that it does affect mainly women, I think, is hugely significant. Um, it's a problem of diagnosis, it's a problem of treatment, it's a problem of... Um, the pro Sometimes patients are just parked on T4, which is the, the uh, thyroxine, the synthetic thyroxine. And although a lot of the studies 
or a lot of the, the medical profession will say people do well on that. Actually, a lot of people who are on it, as I was for many years, don't know they're not doing well because they are functioning, but they don't realise that the, th the fibromyalgia that they have, the, the difficulty getting up in the morning, the hair thinning, the dry skin, all sorts of things that go with it, they, they don't realise that actually they're not doing that well on their T4 because they are just managing to function. So for a lot of patients like myself on T3, that makes a huge difference. Plus you might not be converting your T4 as well. Um, part of it too is whether or not desiccated thyroid hormone should be available. It's available in other countries and a lot of patients in this country are using the internet sometimes with um, with problems of uh, cloning of cards and things like that. They're, they're buying it from abroad. You know, Personally, that's something that whilst tempted to do, I wouldn't really want to do myself. It could be, it could be GPs could prescribe it here, but they are concerned that there might be backlash repercussions. So I think that's something that's really important. So could I, I suppose, just to cut to the chase here and, and I look at um, the actions that, that that you have in front of you. It would be a shame, I think, if the Petitions Committee haven't done all the work on it. Um, and, and I think you have about 100 stories, which we got together really quickly as well, which tell tell the tale. Um, I think it would be a shame if, if it were to be closed, for example, or even if it were to be referred to the Health Committee. I'm not saying that that wouldn't be an option, but I do think it's a bit more cross-cutting, particularly with the equality issues around women as well. So... Um, I think that personally, um, yes, it, the Scottish Government could perhaps try to extrapolate, I'm looking at your recommendations or your action, they, they could try to extrapolate the Scottish figures from the survey, although I do think that, that the experience won't be particularly different to the rest of the UK. Um, and I do, personally, I know the petitioner would like, if possible, the, commit, the committee to take evidence from Dr John Midgley, who has got a lot of good knowledge and experience to share and, and is willing to come and, and speak to the committee. So I think that's something that the previous committee were thinking about and um, I, I would recommend that. Um, so I think for me, um, it would be ideal actually if the committee were able to do their own inquiry or mini inquiry into this, but I don't know what your work your work is like and your time scales. But given that it's been going on so long, it's been so interesting, the committee have taken a huge interest in it. I think that, that for the, the, the petitioner, would be um, would be something that would be worth doing, and also it does take in other issues. It takes in fibromyalgia. People with ME, for example, when you look at the figures there, there are quite a high proportion of people with ME who have existing underactive thyroid. You know, so there are other conditions perhaps that it might also be impacting on, and maybe not being diagnosed. So I, I would just, um, I suppose, uh, want to make a plea to the committee to to build on the work that's been done over the past five years and see if there's any outcomes that that you could any conclusions that you could reach. Mm -hmm. Angus. Yes, yeah, thanks, <coughs> convener. Um, yeah, cl clearly, uh, the, the, the petitions committee has been looking at this for 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 some time, uh, and I think I'm on record in previous sessions of of been unable to comprehend why. Um, desiccated thyroid hormone is not more freely available. It's, it just seems beyond me why why, why that's the case. Uh, and particularly when you hear that uh, patients are having to buy um, the, the, the desiccated thyroid hormone themselves from abroad on, on the internet just uh, is, is beyond belief. Uh, I think it's such an important issue that I, I would definitely be, be loath to, to close the petition and I think there is merit in Elaine Smith's suggestion that there should be a mini inquiry. So perhaps we could keep the petition open until we have our, uh, we've had a, a look at our work program, sure. um, and then uh, bring it back to committee on the first uh, available opportunity. I think that that seems sensible. We can look at it in terms of program. But in the meantime, it would be probably worthwhile flagging up to Scottish government. We really, would be interested in in what they are proposing to do, particularly around. Um, the petition in light of Thyroid UK's survey and whether they can take out the Scottish figures from that and whether they have any comments to send us. But we would certainly look at the feasibility of, of what we could actually do, whether it was an evidence taking session or something more substantial than that. Okay. Uh, Andrew Midgley, you know, for having an evidence session would be really useful so we can get some medical guidance on it from. Okay. Yeah. Is it worth contacting just? Or there may be already evidence there that he's one we'd want to share with the committee in written form. 
Yeah. Sorry, we have some in a lot in written form. Um, I think one of the things is that the round table way back at the beginning seemed to be a bit establishment focused and part of this is is not thinking the way things have always been done. It's it's looking at it a bit differently and looking uh -huh, and looking at other <laughs> other evidence that is actually out there that and, and to, uh, I just call it the medical establishment and I suppose big pharma who who have the products the only products we can that can be used like T4 there's only one manufacturer of T3 in, in the whole of the UK which is worrying as well um, so just maybe getting I think different evidence would be my plea okay let's look at that in our, in our um, consideration of our work program but certainly right to Scottish Government in the meantime okay thanks very much um, if we can move on to petition 1477 on gender neutral human papillomavirus vaccination. This petition calls for the extension of the HPV vaccination programme to include boys. The session four committee's legacy paper invites us to consider this petition in light of an update from the Scottish Government on its position on implementing a gender neutral HPV vaccine programme prior to any JCVI recommendation. That response has been received, as has a submission from the petitioner, and I'd be interested in members' views on the next steps. Um, yes, uh, thanks, Convener. I, I note the um, submission from the petitioner, uh, Jamie Ray, on behalf of um, Throat Cancer Foundation, that um, he's asked us to write to the Secretary of State for Health in England um, to highlight uh, concern about the, the narrowness of the JCVI's approach uh, and request that, that um, the Secretary of State explores ways to broaden its assessment of the evidence to take account of all issues pertinent to HPV vaccination policy. Um, I don't think is it within this committee's remit to write to Secretaries of State in, in England. Um, if so, um, perhaps this is something that I, I, I personally think this committee has exhausted all avenues uh, with regard to this issue, and it may be the case that it should be referred to the Health Committee, um, but it's, I'm certainly yes. open to. I would support that. I think it should be referred to the Health Committee. I'm just not sure what other route we could go down, and I'm, I take Angus's point about, you know, what what our involvement with the, the health, public health in England would be. Um, so I, I think it really has to go back to our health committee. Yeah. That seemed like, a, a, we recognise the, the, the concerns within the petition, but we would take the view that this would be most usefully directed to the health committee and see how they would take it forward. I think so, yeah. Is that agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Okay. Oh. The next petition is Petition 1480 from Alzheimer's and Dementia Awareness, um, 1533, the abolition of non-residential social care charges for older and disabled people. So these are two petitions that the Session 4 Committee agreed to consider together as they both concern fairness and social care charging. The first is by Amanda Copo on behalf of the Frank Copo Alzheimer awareness campaign and the second is by Jeff Adamson on behalf of Scotland Against the Care Tax. The government has been undertaking a review of fairness and social care charging and there is the option to seek an update on any action that's been taken in relation to the petitions. But again I would invite members' views on how we take this forward. For what it's worth I think there are huge issues here. I know that in the election all, um, I think at least four of the five parties elected to this parliament made general commitments around this without being specific. My colleague um, from the last parliament, Siobhan McMahon, was pursuing um, a, a member's bill on the whole question of abolishing um, charges for care in, in, for people at home, non-residential so social care charges. Um, and a wide range of organisations, as we can see from the paper, are very concerned about this question, both in terms of actually what it means um, in reality in terms of people's care support, but also whether there's a question of human rights because some of it is determined by age. 
I don't know if people have views on what we might want to do. Huge, huge issue. Um, I'm, I can only think it has to be referred to the Scottish Government to, to, to get their input on it. Um, it's, I can't see a clear route for us at the moment to go down unless anyone else. Glad you said that <laughs> before I did. Because <laughs> I'm weighing through this, it's, it's huge. Is that quite? I mean, I think the Frank Copel um, campaign, um, the awareness campaign, did flag up just that what what it can mean for people if they if they if they take this condition when they're younger. But also um, the whole question of care charging and the difference in levels of care charging in different parts of our um, communities. Whether it's too much for the at this stage of the petitions committee to take on, it's far more than perhaps the work of this committee. Maybe it would be worthwhile in order to reflect. The seriousness of the issues that have been flagged up to is we want at least a, as a first step to ask the Scottish Government for an update on its review of fairness in social care charging and whether it is minded to take the action called for in both petitions, given that they will have some manifesto commitments that are in, that are in this area and it would be interesting to know how they at least plan to take that forward. Would that be appropriate? To go down in initially. Uh -huh. Okay, um, is that agreed? Thanks very much for that. If we can then move on to petition 1540, the permit solution for the A83. This petition is calling for a permit solution to the issues with landslides in the A83 at the rest and be thankful. The briefing summarises where developments in this issue have got to so far, but it is clear that there are concerns still outstanding about the measures that are being taken. I should also indicate that the local constituency MSP, Mike Russell, has flagged up his support for this petition. Um, I, mean, I do think it would be worthwhile getting an update on planned improvement works from the government. Um, but I wonder if members have a view on that or any other suggestions that have been made. And there's no doubt this has a massive impact at a, a local level, both just for tourism, for the local community, for the local economy. And clearly, there's quite a significant amount of work already been done. Welcome. Any comments? Angus? Yeah, um, just a say, convener, that it's it's been the the past practice on this committee that if a local member particularly asks for a petition to be kept open and, and gives good reason for it, then uh, that that request is usually uh, accepted. Um, and I think there's there's uh, st there's a lot of outstanding issues with regard to the A83 and, and that particular s section of it, so uh, it would be good to get a further response from the Scottish Government. Is that agreed? Mm -hmm. I think it is in recognition of just how significant it is to the local economy and just with the um, issues that have already been flagged up that we want to see signal that we do regard it's important and we would welcome a response from the Scottish Government. Okay. Thank you. I must be missing one here. Where is the... Right. The next petition is um, residential care provision for the severely learning disabled. The next petition is on residential care provision for the severely learning disabled um, and is by Anne Maxwell on behalf of the Muir Maxwell Trust. The Scottish Government has been working with the petitioner to identify measures that could be taken to address the issue raised in the petition and the most appropriate course of action at this stage may be to seek an update on the progress that's been made. Um, and again, I'd be interested in members' views. And I would agree that that's, uh, we, we need to seek a, an update on progress. OK, is that agreed? It's a really important issue, and I think we, that's our first, first port of call, is to find out what's, what, state we're, what, what stage we're at with it. Yep, and I think there is an issue about the extent to which there is an assessment of the, the level of need mm -hmm. and the effective assessment of, of the condition as well. Okay, if that's agreed, we can move on to petition 1563 on sewage sludge spreading. P1563 called for a ban on the spreading of sewage sludge. The background to the issue and the work has been taken in reviewing the use of sludge is summarised in the briefing note. A number of commitments have been made and actions to take forward improvements in relation to the use of sludge, 
but it is clear that the Scottish Government does not support a ban on the use of sludge. I'm aware that um, Angus MacDonald has a, um, a, an interest in this matter, and so before I ask more generally for views, it would be useful for him to uh, comment on issues raised. Yeah, uh, thanks, Convener. Um, I'd certainly clearly I have a local interest, however, um, it's an issue that has been affecting other parts of the country as well, uh, certainly the Central Belt and down Ayrshire way as well. Um, I'd be keen to keep this petition open uh, until we've had sight of the responses to the consultations and that we have an indication uh, of what legislative changes will be required or will be introduced. Um, since the submission of this petition, the petitioners have engaged with the Scottish Government, especially the Environmental Quality Division, which has been uh, welcomed by uh, everyone. Uh, however, I would ask that the committee keep a watching brief uh, on progress, as, as this issue is far from resolved. Uh, in short, convener, um, I don't want to let the government off the hook on this one, and uh, I don't want to let the government off the hook on anything, but <laughs> 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 um, I'm, <laughs> I'm particularly keen to, to, uh, to make sure that um, we, we keep a watching brief on this one. Okay. So, um, we would want to, to keep this open, um, even although we recognise the Scottish Government doesn't support what the petition is calling for. What's your view, um, Angus, on the fact that the Scottish Government has said it's planning to strengthen the regulatory framework in this area? Well, oh, clearly it's it's welcome, yeah. Um, but the point is how, how much are they going to strengthen it? Uh, I mean, it may be that we could ask the petitioners to, to comment on on the um, comment further on, on any progress that's, that's made with, with strengthening the legislation. Um, or another option would be that the petitioners come back with another petition in the future if, if, um, if it were to be closed, but um, I'd, I'd rather that wasn't the case. Can, can I suggest what <laughs> we do is we write to the Scottish Government, um, given this is a new uh, government and perhaps new conditions, is this still their view? And what is their, their, their position on strength? What is it they're going to do to strengthen the regulatory framework? And then we can take a decision at that point. Okay. Would that yeah, be fair? That's fair enough, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, thanks very much for that. If we can move on then to petition 1568 on the funding, access and promotion of the NHS CIC. The penultimate petition on our agenda today relates to the funding, access and promotion of the NHS Centre for Integrative Care, which is located at Gartnavel in Glasgow. On the basis of the information that we have been provided with, I think it would be helpful to seek a bit of clarity from NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde as to the outcome of service reviews that have been undertaken in relation to the CIC. It might also be helpful to ask the government to confirm whether any changes to the provision of services would change its view on providing national funding to the CIC and for an update on the National Service for Chronic Pain. I wonder if people have any comments. And we have quite significant correspondence in this. People have any comments on it? Elaine Smith. Sorry, Sorry convener, I didn't want to jump in in front of the committee. So if you wish to take your committee members first. Well, if we, I think it will inform our thinking of you, what you have to say first. Okay, well, thank you very much. Again, it's a petition that's been going on for some time in the previous committee. Did do quite a bit of work on it. I, I came along to the petitions committee at times. Um, I had constituents interest at the time because the, the CIC clinic in Cope Bridge was being shut and also had constituents um, who, who, who had an interest in the Glasgow situation as well. Um, I still would wish to take an, an interest in it uh, for the wider central Scotland region. So I, I think there has been a, information that isn't quite matching up to what the evidence the committee heard before as to what evidence is coming out now from the health board, for example. If this is lost as a national uh, facility, then th that would be quite tragic for many, many people who, who depend on it. And I think it's a shame about the outreach clinics as well, because people with a lot of conditions um, can, can actually improve their conditions with this kind of assistance. You know, it's not all just about homeopathic, which I think is a danger that people can fall into when, when they think about the Centre for Integrative Care. It's far, far more than that, and pain management, etc., is important too. But I actually was, was um, interested in reading the submission that you have from our colleague, Alec Neil, MSP, who, of course, was uh, a previous health minister. And I think that's a, quite a powerful submission 
on the issue. Um, and and so uh, I think that um, personally, I know you have a recommendation to refer it to the Health and Sport Committee, and maybe that's something that, that you would wish to consider. But um, I do think the committee's done an awful lot of work, and maybe even just getting some further information first f for this committee would be would be a good idea. Any other views? I think it's important that we we ask the the health board, you know, for an update on, on exactly where we are with it now. Um, and you know, I, I agree with, with with what Elaine's saying. I think it's. Um, I think we should refer it to the, the health and sport committee, but probably before that, speak to the NH. Uh, SGGC. I, mean, I think what we'd be asking the health board for is information, just clarification what their position is, yes. because we don't have the authority yes. to quiz them about decisions they would make in terms of the budgets. But the consequence of any decision they make is about whether the Scottish Government is prepared to fund these, this centre. And if they're not prepared to fund it, then that would be an indication of, of health policy by the Scottish Government, really, but um, not prior, or not viewing the, the, the this centre something that they want to continue to fund. So I think we should contact the Health Board. Yeah. We should also contact the Scottish Government, what its position is. Um, and I do think after that we should be referring to the Health Committee because it feels to me that the issues around this are about the benefits in health terms of this kind of approach. And that would not necessarily be simply a view for the Public Petition Committee. It's much more about where people's judgments lie. And I think Elaine might be right that um, homeopathy is, is part of it and an argument around that, but the centre may be provide more than that that we're unaware of. Um, Brian? I think homeopathy is, 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 is one of those treatments out there that's much debated. I mean, the other, the acupuncture, counselling and dietary, uh, you know, there's, there's, nothing, there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with them at all. Um, and it just seems to me what you're suggesting is that... Uh, People are focusing on homeopathy as the reason to quote that they're going to shut this, rather than all the other uh, uh, treatments that are available there. Mm -hmm. Lee, thanks, convener. Yes, I do think that uh, sometimes, it, and I wouldn't necessarily wish to suggest that that's deliberate, but I do think it's convenient. Sometimes this offers a far wider range as well to people. Um, it, it can actually make people economically active again who, who weren't before. We're back to thyroid conditions too. It can be very helpful for people with conditions like fibromyalgia that comes through issues like thyroid. So these things again seem to tie in. Uh, so I, I think it provides a hugely valuable service. It, it undoubtedly saves um, the economy and the health service, I would imagine, money with people being able to, to use those kind of services and to gain out of it. And I think it's unfortunate. I mean, personally, I think there's a lot to be said for homeopathy in, in, in certain circumstances. And if, if people are finding it helpful, even if that's only a placebo effect, and surely that's got to be a good thing. However, I do think it is controversial. And there is a lot of focus on that, which actually mm -hmm. detracts from other, other um, aspects. So the people who use it, are deeply, deeply concerned about losing services or, or not having the pain clinic, for example, it was promised. But if I might just be be um, be bold to the committee and just perhaps suggest that, that looking back at the evidence session that, that this committee had before, seeing what was said there and matching it up to, to what now seems to be being said might be an exercise too for the committee. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um can I suggest that we do just confirm that we write to the Health Board and just to clarify what's happening? To write to the Scottish Government, ask whether it will review its position in funding and like these possible changes to provision of services, to refer it to the Health and Sports Committee, but we should look back at, um, and perhaps we could do that as part of our away day, just to look at and reflect then as a sense of further we can do, given what was said in the past, if that's useful. It may just be a minor detail that we write to the, the health board to ask for the update and wait on their response before we contact, until we ask the Scottish Government anything, because what we need is clarification from them, so that when we go to the government, we can say this is what we've just been just been told. I mean, if we do it all at the, the one time, we're, we're, we're surmising what the help. We haven't had anything back from the health board. At I that suspect point. the Scottish Government will have read the same reports that we've read about what the health board's planning to do and may indeed be in conversation with them. And if they're not, uh -huh. then 
I presume it would prompt them to ask and they may get a speedier mm -hmm. well, response than you So I just maybe to expedite yes. things, we do both at the same time, but we recognise one follows upon the other. Okay. Okay, is that agreed? Okay, agreed. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks very much then. Um, and finally, if we can move on to petition 1571 on food bank funding. The final petition we'll consider today calls for direct funding of food banks. Um, the Scottish Government does not support this call. I should, of course, actually um, indicate that the petitioner is John Beatty, who is also somebody with whom I've uh, worked. Um, he's someone who is involved in community activity in, in the Govan area in Glasgow um, and has raised this issue of food banks with me directly, but also clearly now through this petition. Um, the Scottish Government does not support the call in the, the petition to directly fund food banks I'm interested in people's comments on the petition, and I think maybe one suggestion might be to refer the petition to Social Security Committee to enable the issue of food banks to be considered in a wider policy context of Social Security, because it's clearly an informal way in which communities are protecting people, but obviously reflect um, need as well. I wonder if people have a view on that. I think, um, convener, the salient point in the whole argument is we're trying to get to a stage where would, nobody has to rely on, on food banks. Um, and that came out in the in the evidence sessions. But uh, yeah, I, I would agree that we should uh, refer it to the Social Security Committee. Yeah. Without a view, I think, on whether they should be funded or not, but to say that in any Social Security system, they're trying to reflect where need is, the growth of food banks tells us something. We're not necessarily totally clear what it does tell us, but it certainly tells us that there's a need there that has been met on a voluntary basis. That Clearly, it may even just simply be reflecting the failures and weaknesses of the current system has been operated. So if we're agreed then, um, we would refer the petition to Social Security Committee with these, with these comments. And if that's agreed, okay. In that case, um, I think we've come to the conclusion of our business, timorously, I'm glad to say. So I want again to put on record our thanks to witnesses who have come today, to all of our petitioners who have and provide so much food for thought for today and to members of the contributions and I uh, and to the clerks for all the work that clearly is involved even just bringing this agenda together um, and uh, wish everyone all the best in the recess and look forward to seeing you soon and I'll close the meeting. <laughs> <laughs>